So, you know, the principle of computational equivalence has all kinds of implications, and it has some that are, that, uh, are kind of interesting and sort of almost science fiction-y. So one of the, one of the questions is, uh, it's a kind of an old science question, you know, can we really be the smartest things in the universe? Where, where are all the extraterrestrial intelligences and so on? And one might have imagined that, uh, so, you know, I, I had, uh, I had always thought it would, be, it would be great fun to figure out how to um, you know, detect that intelligent signal from something or other. And I slowly realized that that wasn't really the right way to think about things. And actually, it's kind of a, a funny story that's um, uh, uh, about Marconi um, that sort of reveals what some of the issues are. So Marconi you know, invents uh, wireless stuff and has this yacht and goes uh, across the Atlantic and so on. Somewhere in the middle of the Atlantic, he's listening on the radio, and he hears all these weird whistling sounds and so on. And so the question is, what is this, right? And so for him, a, a reasonable guess is it's the Martians sending radio signals. In fact, Tesla was pretty sure it was the Martians sending radio signals. Well, actually, it was the, uh, some uh, magnetohydrodynamic modes of the ionosphere. So it's a physical process that seems like it's showing intelligent kinds of behavior. And so what this principle of computational equivalence says to us is actually this, this thing that we think of as sort of intelligent behavior it's really just sophisticated computation, and sophisticated computation is something that doesn't take a whole civilization with a whole history and so on to build up. It's something that happens in lots of systems in nature as well. It's, it's a little bit disappointing because, you know, we feel like we're, we're very special and we've got this whole civilization, we built it all up, and, uh, you know, can't we do more sophisticated things than some mode of the ionosphere or something? Well, the answer is, sadly, no. I mean, this is kind of a, a long-running thing with science that, you know, goes back to uh, things like Copernicus and so on, realizing we're actually not as special as we thought we were. This is yet another way in which we're not really as special as we think we are. The ancient Greeks, for example, they had a definition of life. They said anything which can move itself must be alive. Okay, so then, you know, steam engines come into existence, and clearly they're not really alive. Then it was uh, various kinds of chemical and thermodynamic definitions, things about self-reproduction. You know, there's any old uh, worm on the Internet that's perfectly happily self-reproducing, and yet we don't really think of it as, as truly alive, because life on Earth shares this kind of common historical lineage. You know, when I remember when I was a kid and the first uh, Mars landers were, were off and running, you know, they were, they were figuring out, you know, how can we tell if there's life on Mars? Well, we take a piece of Martian soil and we feed it sugar and we see if it, you know, produces carbon dioxide. That's a very literal interpretation of what life is. We don't know an abstract definition. We don't know an abstract definition of intelligence either. Um, it's the same, same type of thing. And, and that means that, you know, when, when we start thinking about what does that mean, that at some level that's very philosophical, but at some level it's also practical because we say, you know, let's say we have this wonderful AI box sitting on our desk and it's able to do all this very sophisticated intelligent stuff. The problem is without sort of a connection to human purposes, it's really quite meaningless to us. I mean, we have to, we have to sort of tell it what it should do and then it can go and be very clever about doing it. I mean, I think, in general, as we sort of think about the future of technology and so on, the, the big theme, I think, that's emerging is we, technology is all about automating things. It's all about getting things that we used to have to do ourselves and having them done automatically. But what's increasingly going to, going to happen is we get to say what we want to have happen. We, we get to say what the end goal is supposed to be, what the purpose of what, what's going on is. And then our technology should automate as much as possible of figuring out how to do that. And that's, you know, for example, in the software systems that we build, you know, that's kind of the idea in something like Mathematica. It's like, here's the sort of algorithmic thing I want to achieve. Now it's up to Mathematica to figure out how in detail inside to, you know, pick the specific underlying algorithm, weave things together to actually achieve it. And, and sort of in Wolfram Alpha, you know, you ask it some, you, you talk to your phone or something, you ask it some, some question, it's up to it to figure out both how to answer that question and how to present the answer to you. Um, because that turns out to be a, a big thing, not, not just uh, sort of interfacing with the humans turns out to be a large part of the problem, both understanding the weird language that humans actually talk or type and figuring out when you give a result, you know, it, people don't just want the answer is 42, they typically want some sort of easy to digest report and you have to sort of figure out how to, how to make that presentation in the best way.